A 15-year-old girl disappeared from her bedroom under mysterious circumstances. Police, the FBI, and hundreds of volunteers searched for her. Diving into the case, detectives uncovered many eerie facts and eventually solved this disturbing case. In this video, we tell you what happened to Riley Crossman and why the public was outraged when they learned the bitter truth. Riley Crossman was born on December 22, 2003, in the small American town of Martinsburg, West Virginia. Her parents divorced when she was young, and the girl moved with her mother and younger sister to Berkeley Springs, a town 40 kilometers from Martinsburg. After a while, her mother began dating another man, and they had two more children. However, Riley maintained a close relationship with her father and regularly went to visit him. The girl attended Berkeley Springs High School and took dance and singing lessons. She also had a boyfriend named Hayden Lacey. According to her parents, there was a great relationship between them. Riley was happy. She and her boyfriend even had a joint Instagram account where they posted pictures together. Her mom, Chantel Oakley, worked two jobs. On May 7, 2019, she took off early from her morning shift because she wasn't feeling well. When she arrived home, she texted Riley that she was going to sleep in before her evening shift and asked her to wake her up when the girl returned from school. Riley came home at about 3.30 p.m., woke up her mother, and went to her room. Chantel's roommate's mother was also in the house with her that day, effectively replacing her grandmother and looking after the younger children. Chantel returned from work at about 10 p.m. As she walked past her daughter's room, she saw that her door was closed, but the light was on behind her. Her mother thought Riley was getting ready for bed and went to bed herself almost immediately. She was still not feeling well and wanted to get a good night's sleep before her morning shift. The next day, at about 7.15 a.m., Chantel peeked into her daughter's room before she left for work but Riley wasn't there. She didn't see anything suspicious about that, though. School started at 7.45, and the girl could have gone there already. Riley's school was only a short walk away, so she got there on her own. About halfway through the day, her mother got a call from the school saying that Riley had missed some classes. This alarmed Chantel slightly, but she still didn't see it as a major concern. Her daughter could have just skipped a few classes and gone out with friends. At about 3.30 p.m., Riley's grandmother began to worry. The girl should have been home by now, but still wasn't. Then she contacted Chantel, at which point her mother already suspected something was wrong. Riley was always calling or texting her to take time off to go out with friends after school, but that day she didn't get a single message from her daughter. Her mother had sent her several messages and they had all failed to reach their destination. Then she tried calling her, but each time it went to voicemail. This indicated that Riley's phone was either dead or had been turned off for some reason. Chantel also called Riley's own father, hoping that the girl might have gone to him. However, he too did not contact his daughter that day. The mother asked her grandmother to go to the school and look for Riley there. The grandmother went there, but she was unable to locate the girl. None of the teachers knew where she could be either. Around 5 p.m., Chantel decided to take a day off from work and drove to the school, but she couldn't find her daughter either. She spotted her boyfriend in the parking lot and asked if he had seen Riley, but Hayden stated that he had spent the day on an out-of-town trip and had not even contacted her. Together, they went around the school grounds, looking in and around the building itself, but the girl was nowhere to be found. After a while, her mother decided to go home, hoping that Riley might have returned there. Alas, she was not there either. After waiting some more time, she decided to go to the police. By then, the girl's father had arrived in Berkeley Springs and went in search of his daughter. He drove around the small town asking people he met if they had seen Riley. With a population of just over 600, most of the residents knew each other. One of the local teenagers said he saw her walking down the street. Unfortunately, this information did nothing to help him find Riley, and investigators thought the boy was just mistaken. 
The police quickly began a search, interviewing everyone the girl knew. None of her friends had seen Riley that day, nor had she shown up at school. At the same time, several teachers noted that she was present in their classes. This misled the detectives at first, but it soon became clear. These teachers had simply failed to notice the girl's absence and flagged her down. From conversations with Riley's acquaintances, the police began to reconstruct the chronology of events. They found out that on the evening of May 7th, the girl was on the phone with her boyfriend until 10.30 p.m., and she answered her friend's messages on social media until midnight. What follows is something very strange. At 5.40 a.m., Riley called her boyfriend by video link, but he was asleep at the time and didn't answer. The detectives immediately suspected something was wrong. Why was Riley trying to contact him at such an early hour? The girl's mother assured her that Riley would never run away from home. She simply had no reason to. Given that she was the eldest child in the family, her mother treated her very gently, almost never forbade her to go out with friends or a boyfriend, allowed her to go to her father's house in another town at any time, and generally did not control her every move. The only thing was that Riley always informed her of her plans and asked permission. Considering that the girl was only 15 years old at the time of her disappearance, she had no driver's license, so she also could not leave town on her own in a car. This once again indicated that the version of an escape seemed unlikely. Instead, the detectives considered kidnapping as the most likely theory. The same evening Riley's mother contacted law enforcement, they began a search for the girl. Police officers searched the school and the surrounding area and combed the town. They were quickly joined by community volunteers who cared about Riley. As is usually the case, these small town residents thought nothing like this could happen to them. Soon, the police decided to search Riley's bedroom, and there they found the first grisly piece of evidence. On a pillow and sheets, they found small blood stains. They sent the items immediately to a lab where experts ran a DNA test and determined that the blood belonged to Riley. At this point, everyone realized that something truly terrible had happened to the girl. If her family had hoped to the last that Riley had gone somewhere on her own initiative, after the discovery of the blood, those hopes were dashed. Here, it's worth clarifying why the mother didn't notice traces of blood when she examined her daughter's bedroom a few hours earlier. The bed was made, and it had not occurred to her to lift the blanket. This finding not only indicated that the girl had most likely been attacked, it had all happened in her house, and it was up to the police to figure out who might have done it. After the blood trail was discovered, the search escalated. In the days that followed, more volunteers joined the police. Dozens of people also provided various equipment that might come in handy when surveying the area. At one point, detectives even had to ask the public to stop carrying the equipment because there was already an excess of it. In addition, the police repeatedly gave press conferences to get the story out to the general public. There is always a chance that someone might have noticed something strange, heard suspicious conversations, or stumbled upon potential evidence. So it was important for the police to let everyone in the county know about Riley. After a while, the local police were joined by the FBI, the Department of Homeland Security, and the state police. Together, they continued to search for the missing girl, but with no results. On May 15th, law enforcement decided to bring in additional forces and organized a large-scale search, covering a wide area of many kilometers around the city. The next morning, they announced that they had managed to find Riley Crossman's body. It was about a 40-minute drive from Berkeley Springs, near a country road, near the top of a small mountain. The detectives knew immediately that they were dealing with a murder, not an accident. It looked as if the unknown perpetrator was trying to hide the body as far away from prying eyes as possible. Medical examiners examined the body and confirmed that it was indeed Riley, but they couldn't determine the cause of death because of the extensive decomposition. It was very strange because it had been just over a week since the girl had disappeared. Apparently, the killer had done something to the body. 
investigators noticed several other strange things. First, the girl was wearing only one shoe, and they could not find a second shoe anywhere nearby. Secondly, they concluded that the unknown perpetrator changed her clothes because they had information that the girl was supposed to be wearing leggings and a sweatshirt, while when they found her, she was wearing shorts. They also found traces of whitewash or plaster on her clothing. The police reclassified the case as a homicide, and now they had to find the perpetrator. They re-interviewed all of Riley's relatives and acquaintances and noticed something odd. The testimony of Andy McCauley, Chantel's roommate, did not match the story of another man Andy worked with at a construction site in nearby Hedgesville. He initially told police that on May 8th, Riley's birthday, he did not leave his workplace from morning until late afternoon. However, that same day, around 10 a.m., his neighbor noticed a green Dodge pickup truck in front of their house. The neighbor knew that this car did not belong to either Andy or Chantel. Moreover, Andy's driver's license had been temporarily revoked. With all this in mind, the neighbor asked Chantel what this car was doing in front of their house, but the woman was unaware. After the whole town became aware of Riley's disappearance, the neighbor decided to share the observation with the police. Detectives questioned Andy again. They determined that the vehicle in question belonged to one of his co-workers and the man had not driven it before. The owner of the pickup truck often picked Andy up in the mornings to drive him to work. Upon learning that, the police were aware of his movements that day. Andy changed his statement. He stated that he had actually taken the pickup truck and drove it to buy illegal substances to take with a co-worker at the construction site later in the day. Sometime later, he changed his statement again and said that he went to his house to pick up the substances and then returned to work. All of this already looked very strange, but the detectives had even more creepy discoveries waiting for them next. For starters, they talked to Riley's mother and asked her to recall if she had noticed any oddities in her roommate's behavior. Then she told them that on May 8th, the day her daughter disappeared, Andy had indeed been acting suspiciously. When he returned home that night, Chantel told him about Riley's disappearance. The man immediately said he would go looking for her, got on his bicycle and rode off. However, when the woman returned home from her search, she found Andy asleep on the couch as if nothing had happened. This behavior was very strange. All of Riley's relatives had been combing the streets until late at night, helped by concerned townspeople, while Andy simply went to sleep as if nothing had happened. In addition, one day after the girl went missing, Chantel called Andy and recorded the conversation. Unfortunately, its full content was not disclosed. All we know is that Chantel was already suspicious of Andy at this point and linked it all to his addiction to illegal substances. The police then spoke to Andy's co-worker and found out that, in fact, the men had been absent from work from about 9 a.m. until about 2 p.m. In addition, the co-worker stated that he believed that Andy had banned substances with him to begin with, so there was no reason for him to go somewhere to get them. The detectives then searched for the green Dodge and found a large stain of dried plaster in the trunk. Forensics showed that it was the same substance found on Riley's clothing. Investigators also led service dogs to the pickup, which detected a deadly smell in the trunk. They also found some pretty specific bolts in the car, which are rarely used. Two of the exact same bolts were found near Riley's body. The police soon found another inconsistency in Andy's statement. They examined camera footage from nearby communities and found that on May 8, the man was only a few miles from where Riley's body would later be found. He was caught on gas station store cameras and on several traffic cameras. It was all very strange. Andy didn't have a driver's license, was usually picked up by other people, and got around on his bike. But this day, for some reason, he took someone else's car and drove it around for half a day on unfamiliar routes. Another co-worker told police that on May 8, Andy asked him for three construction bags. 
Detectives were also approached by Angie's former co-worker, who told an even creepier story. He said that he and Andy had never gotten along, but between about 2 a.m. and 4 a.m. on May 8th, Andy called him dozens of times and also sent a whole bunch of messages. He was in a panic and said he needed to hide with someone right away. Andy explained that he was in possession of illegal substances and was afraid of being caught. This former colleague did not let him in that night, but later reported the story to the police. In his defense, the man stated that he had taken illegal substances that night, after which he noticed a police car parked not far from his house and panicked. Except, the police department checked this information and found that none of their cars were in that area. This meant that Andy's story was a common lie. All of the above was enough for the police to arrest Andy the day after the body was found and charge him with murder. The man denied guilt, so the case went to trial. The case then stalled for more than two years as the trial did not begin until September 27, 2021. This was due to the coronavirus and the limitations associated with it, as well as the peculiarities of the U.S. court system where such delays are the norm. Nevertheless, even more gruesome details of the case emerged during the course of the trial. For starters, Chantel, in her speech, provided one disturbing detail about the evening of May 7th. That afternoon, she returned from work at 10 p.m. and Andy was asleep on the couch. When she entered the room, the man immediately woke up. When she saw his eyes, Chantel immediately thought he had taken illegal substances. Andy had used powerful drugs before and even had a criminal record for possession, of which the woman was well aware. Further, the prosecution revealed information about disturbing messages sent from Riley's phone shortly before her disappearance. At 11 p.m. on May 7th, the girl texted her boyfriend that Andy had just gone into her room. Twelve minutes later, she sent another text where she wrote that she was scared. She never contacted him again. Unfortunately, Hayden had already gone to bed at that time and did not see these messages. By morning, they had already been deleted. At trial, he also said that Andy had repeatedly entered Riley's room that night. The girl was video chatting with her boyfriend and Hayden could hear him enter the room. Andy asked her to do the dishes and talked about some other mundane things, but Riley was unequivocally afraid of him. She asked Guy not to pass out while Andy was in her room. It also came out at trial that Andy had called Riley several times around 3 a.m., but she wouldn't pick up the phone, and on the third time, she blocked his number altogether. The whole thing was very creepy and incomprehensible. According to the prosecution's version, Andy made these calls to see if Riley was communicating with her boyfriend at the time. Later, the records of these calls were deleted from both phones, but the cell phone provider still had them. Despite all this, the prosecution had no evidence to indicate what had happened that night. They speculated that Andy killed Riley late that night, waited until morning, and drove to work. He then borrowed a co-worker's car, drove to the house, picked up the body, and took it to a secluded spot. He then cleared the message and call history from her phone and got rid of it. It also emerged at trial that Chantel and Andy's own mother not only knew about his addiction to illegal substances, they also knew that under their influence, the man was becoming aggressive and dangerous. The final court hearing was held on October 5, 2021. Despite the fact that all available evidence was circumstantial and did not connect Andy directly to the murder, the jury reached a guilty verdict. He was found guilty of murder and sentenced to life in prison. Further consideration was given to the possibility of parole. Andy's attorneys asked to give their client the option after 15 years, but the judge ultimately ruled for life without the possibility of parole. As the judge pronounced the sentence, Andy showed no emotion. He also seemed detached and uninterested at previous hearings. Apparently, he had resigned himself to the inevitable. But what about motive? Because of the degree of decomposition, the experts could not establish whether Riley had been abused. This, however, is the most obvious option. 
Even though the court could not prove it, this story was widely covered in the American media and people's opinions were divided. Some put part of the blame on the girl's mother, who brought a convicted drug addict into her home and built a family with him. At the trial, she assured them that it had never even occurred to her that Andy might harm her children. Others defended the mother, believing that she could not have foreseen such an outcome. She worked two jobs most of the time to feed her family, and perhaps she didn't even have time to think about her decisions might affect her children. What remains unclear is the moment of that 5.30 a.m. video call made from Riley Hayden's phone. Was the girl still alive at that moment? Or did Andy make the call to throw off the investigation later? Do you think Chantel should be blamed for the situation? Tell us what you think and don't forget to like this video. Take care and thanks for watching.